This is Chaos Cast, the Chaos Community Podcast, where we share use cases and experiences with measuring open source community help, elevating conversations about metrics, analytics, and software from the Community Health Analytics Open Source Software, or short Chaos Project, to wherever you like to listen. Welcome to this episode. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Sustain, a community of open source enthusiasts and professionals that care about the future of open source. Learn more at sustainoss.org. On today's episode, we have something different from normal. We are taking the conversation from our app ecosystem working group and sharing it with you. We invited some experts in because we have a topic that we decided we wanted some outside input. So let's first introduce the panelists from the working group, Neo and Sri. Neo. Hi, everyone. My name is Neoftes Kolokotronis. I'm a KD contributor, mostly working on community and organizational projects. I'm also a member of the board of directors of the KDEV, the organization that supports the community. And in my day job, I'm an innovation progress manager, supporting startups, getting their products to the market, among other things. Welcome, Neil. Shri. Yeah, my name is uh, Shri Ram Ramkrishna, or Shri. I'm a member of the GNOME project. I also am one of the organizing members of the application ecosystems, and I guess one of the founding members of this working group. So... I currently work for IT Renew, which is a hardware company that works in the circular data center where we build servers using recyclable components. Welcome, Shri. And myself, Georg Link. Hi, I'm director of sales at Petrugia, co-founder of the Chaos Project. And just to give you a little background on the app ecosystem working group, we started last year with the goal of developing metrics for app ecosystems like KDE and GNOME and providing for several different personas in these large communities metrics. And so for today, what we want to talk about is marketing and communication. And what does that mean in these projects? And how can we support the people in these communities doing marketing and communication with metrics? And so we invited four guests today and i'll just go in alphabetical order if you could just introduce yourself and what community you're with and what you do there that would be great anika hi my name is anika hoker and i'm working as a marketing consultant for kde this is my first time that i'm working for an open source or software organization previously i've worked more with non-profit organizations and educational sector I would say that it is quite different for me to work for KD. Yeah, welcome, Anika. Caroline. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm the brand manager for the GNOME Foundation. I come from a background in graphic design and marketing. So for GNOME, that means I work on a lot of fun projects like designs for foundation projects and events, uh, as well as managing social media and running things like our shop. Awesome. Welcome. Christy. Hi, I am Christy Progri. I'm currently working as the GNOME program coordinator for around two years now. I've been around for software for around six to seven years before I've been the chairwoman of local hackerspace in Tirana. And yeah, I joined GNOME and now I'm working as well with the KDE Falls for the Linux Hub Summit. Welcome, Christy. Thank you. I'm Paul and I work with KD as a communications expert in the promo team. And I have been working with free software since 1996 as a writer, editor, publisher, especially in the area of magazines and stuff like that. Before that, I was an English teacher. So awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. As I was saying in the introduction, in the App Ecosystem Working Group, and here at Chaos, we wanted to develop some metrics for people just like you who are taking care of the brand and the communication and marketing of the open source communities and projects. So as we go in Chaos, we always like to 
tie metrics back to specific questions that we need to answer, which come from the goals that we have and the work that we do. So working the way from goals to questions to metrics, could you maybe describe what are the goals that you have when you are doing your jobs for these uh, GNOME and KDE communities? Well, in KDE, what we're looking for is when we analyze metrics is we try to find out if we are being effective communicators. Basically, that's it. You know, see if what we put out there resonates with people and then if it has some sort of follow through and impacts stuff like, well, if it increases the downloads for that or increases the number of blog posts about topics that we're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, that's what we're looking for. I would echo that for goals for GNOME, but I just add that when we are marketing to people or, you know, outreaching to people, it's our goals for that is just to communicate stories that they're going to, or hopefully will be interested in about GNOME and what we do and connect with them on those levels and see what they're interested in and how we can better fit with those ideals. Yeah. Thank you for taking that a step back and talk more broadly about what it means to do marketing communications for GNOME and KDE. What does a typical day-to-day -day look like for the work that you're doing? Basically, if we're talking about metrics, we do every day, for example, monitor things like what has appeared in the press or in the... We have several alerts on Google and things like that and see if there are some keywords that come up and then we go and read that and It's all done by hand, basically. Yes, there's nothing really sophisticated about it. We get the Google alert. We go, we read it, see, see what the sentiment is. We put it into a, a database or into a spreadsheet or whatever. On Thursdays, Annika knows this, it's day-to-day. -day. It's the day we download stuff from Twitter and we download stuff from uh, Facebook and all these things. And again, they go into a database or into a spreadsheet. And then we make pretty graphs and we look at them and say, and see if we're doing it or we're rubbish or whatever. It is something we do on a daily basis, monitor what people say. I think all your work is more day to day, but mine is more related to long term goals because I'm focusing on more on increasing diversity and how we can bring more people from the external community. So if I would say that long-term goals are of KDE promo are so uh, factual, but we do not have any resource to actually check that. We say that we want to increase 5% users, but how are we going to do that until we don't have any resources? For me, it's more day-to-day -day work that I'm trying to get in more people, seeing what are the projects which we can bring in, which can actually attract new users, which are outside the FOSS community. So what are you using to measure that today in terms of, do you set a goal and then you have some way of measuring that or what's your current methodology? We do have a series of goals that are very concrete. We have them on our wiki page. I can't remember all of them, although I did write them. <laughs> It was a long time ago, but and we do refer to them often. And one of them is, for example, about what Annika just said, which is increase the diversity. Because as we know, it's not worth beating around the bush. There is a lack of diversity in open source in general, and it affects all of us. So one of our objectives is to have more ethnic and gender-based diversity. And that one is kind of hard to measure. We also have to take into account the privacy factors that are very important for us as open source community members. We cannot intrude on other people's privacy and require that they tell us what is their gender, what is their race, or what is their anything. That would be really intrusive and really wrong. We can only ask them to volunteer that. So it is true that for things like that, it is hard. We try to go through indirect methods, but they're not... <laughs> Indirect methods tend to be unreliable. So we have tried doing surveys. That is not very popular. We do have in Plasma, we have a, a series of technical ways of measuring metrics, but they are turned off by default. It's opt-in, it's not opt-out. So, And that only measures things like technical stuff, like what version of the framework you're running or what version of Plasma you're running. So to get to the more personal uh, level, we have to look at things like 
a photo of our latest academy. So we look, are there more women this time? Are there more non-white Europeans this time? And things like that. And that's the way we have to do it. It is getting better, I must say, that we do have more diversity in those photos. But again, it's a very, not very scientific way of going through things because, you know, the people who are public can go to academy or go to sprints or go to other events with us. That is a very small subset of people who use KD, of course. So, you know, how do we know? That is the method we have so far, which is, as I say, a bit rubbish. But okay. Yeah, we've tried to, to measure somehow the diversity and inclusion level also in GNOME. In our main conferences like Guadec and GNOME Asia and also uh, Linux Sub Summit, by the end of the event, we send out a survey to all the speakers and all participants and we ask some questions, which is completely up to them whether to answer or not. It's not mandatory on them. Where they're from, what's their age, uh, their background, where they're connecting from. And by this way, we try to gather as many data as possible. And by the end of the conferences, we get the organizing team gathers back again and we discuss, hey, for example, we have very few people joining us from Asia. So let's try to uh, figure out how to fix this for the, for the next edition. And this is how we try to measure the level of, of participation in our conferences. It would be nice, I think, to have to have such thing also for the general community where people are located and what they're mostly interested in. So maybe we can have a more like a bigger picture regarding the diversity and the and the inclusion. But basically this is how we, we try to work up fixing things in our conferences. May I ask something? How successful are you with this? Because we have had some pushback against surveys asking these things. And then we have tried to do these things at Academy. And a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, just ignore the survey and don't fill them in. You know, So in the end, if you're taking a small subset of your community and there's an even smaller subset, which are the only ones who are going to fill it in, are you successful with this? Do you get a lot of people answering? From my experience, what I see is that if a conference, like it's two days after the conference, things are a little bit cooled down and we don't really get many responses. So what we usually do is that we start to send out the survey at the last day of the conference. So people are still enthusiastic, you know, participating in our, in our communities in some way. And we try to keep it short so we don't get, you know, bored with a lot of questions. I can say that we have received a good amount of replies this Guadec. And I can say also for sure that for last, we had many feedback, which were so helpful to us regarding the numbers, because it helped us see what can we fix and what can we do better. So for us, like, at least in my experience with, with the surveys, we have surveys have worked pretty well. I'd also add that we try to kind of front load some of the questions by including optional demographics in the registration. So things like, where are you joining us from? And we get that out of the way in the registration so that the survey later can be more about feedback on the event and follow up. But those are always optional. So not everybody will fill them out. So we've talked about the goals that you have for the community and bring more diverse people and that you want to have that feedback loop of how successful you are. Is our community becoming more diverse? What's the current state? And I understand survey and self-reporting is the way that you currently have. And that's fine. And so are there other goals that you have for your communities besides bringing in more diverse people? World domination, obviously. That is, oh, <laughs> that is all. <laughs> I must say that you laugh, but in every single academy, there's someone who comes in with a talk that says, you know, have we dominated the world yet? And the answer is usually no, but okay. The yearly year, the desktop thing, right? Yeah, that always triggers me. I don't know why, but it does. <laughs> One of the goals we're working on is, well, always more users, but also more general to that. We just want to make sure that we're spreading kind of brand awareness of Gnome, like we're getting our voice 
and our image and our brand out there so people know who we are and what we do and how they're using us or if they're not using us and maybe they should be, you know. On that point, when any of you are on, say, something like this podcast, do you do you go back, do you look at audience numbers or anything like that as sort of an indication of brand propagation? Normally when we do something like an interview or be on a podcast, etc., there is usually let's say echoes through the blogosphere and stuff like that. So we measure that because what usually happens is that somebody will post something about, it's usually more useful to us to see kind of like the, what people have written about the, what we have done or said about what we have done than the direct metrics. The direct metrics is usually quite small because we are in a very concrete niche. But then if somebody picks it up and puts it on ZDNet or or on the register or something like that, then that is what we can see uh, usually. Obviously, we do measure things like how our videos do on YouTube or or when we do a sprint, we measure how many people watch that and things like that. It also, I think, depends on on what it is we're spreading and where it is. So, for example, while we were running the community engagement challenge, the team that's working on that put out a press release to just launch the challenge. And we would check where it got picked up. And we asked people who submitted applications or proposals in the first round of the challenge where they heard about it. So we could kind of gauge what was the most successful channel there. And we had a YouTuber that we shared the news with, put it on their channel, and that actually got us the most applications. So we do check that kind of thing where we can. So we know like, oh, that's a great channel. People are following and watching that channel. We should try and have more of a relationship with that YouTuber and maybe others like them. Do you mind going a little bit into the contributor challenge? Explain to us what it is and what you did with that program. I'm just curious. I heard of it last year and I would just like to know, you know, for the audience, just to recap what it is, but then also how it went and where your status is today. Sure. The Community Engagement Challenge was a partnership with Endless. So we worked with them to sort of create this bigger challenge, which we hoped would engage new ideas for getting contributors and keeping contributors to not just GNOME, but also open source projects. And so the goal was for teams or individuals to propose concepts or ideas for projects that they thought would bring in more contributors and be able to teach people how to code and keep them coding for open source. So we did that in three phases and we're currently just ending the last phase right now. And each phase had a round of winners and prizes for those winners. And then they would move on to the next phase and they'd submit again. And they, if they won that phase, they get a prize and they move on to the next phase. So the third phase just ended. We're currently in the judging stage and then we're going to have a showcase. And I think it's April 7th to announce the grand winner and end the challenge that way. Thank you for recapping that. It's quite interesting. I'll be interested to see who, who wins and what comes of those ideas. So one of the things I know we talked about before, especially as it comes to brand and awareness and world domination, is the need to know, like, what is our market share? What is our user base? Can you maybe explain your thoughts on, on, on those metrics? Well, we don't know, do we? This is the great problem of open source and free software. We never know because we can never leverage the tools that proprietary software companies can leverage, which is basically spying on you and things like that. Phoning home every time you start an application, which is all the things that we hear about and, you know, get really upset about. So, and of course, there are so many channels through which users can get our software. Most of them we do not control in any way. So they can get software from directly from a distribution, and the distribution doesn't have to share their numbers with us, or the distribution often doesn't even know what their numbers are exactly, or they can get it from that to the Windows Store. We have, I know, several applications on the Windows Store. We know they're doing very well. We know the numbers of that because the Windows Store does keep tabs on how many sales there are. But of course, that, that is 
on Windows, only on one platform. How many people use Krita? We know that is in the hundreds of thousands, maybe in, I am a bit, I'm going to be a bit, not going to say maybe millions, I don't know that, but we know that it's very popular. It's probably our most popular software. But because we extrapolate from the store, we extrapolate from the window, from the window store, we extrapolate from the popcorns that we get from Debian, for example, or from Arch, etc. But again, we're looking at such a minute subset of users of all that use them that, you know, it's, it's impossible to know. The day that chaos can tell us there are X number of Linux desktop users, that day, would be a great day. That day will be greater than the year Linux desktop. <laughs> that, that would be fantastic if we could solve that problem. But, and it's such a great metric because when we're trying to make the argument that we are influential, meaning if we're trying to convince third party developers to use our platform or we're trying to do maybe large applications to support our platform they want to know if the effort is worth it and that's why these numbers are important because that tells them the level of investment they would like to do on our platform so this is the million dollar or euro question depending on where you're from right so yeah that's one comment i have to make on that while open source software today is powering critical infrastructure the open source ecosystem as a whole is rapidly changing, facing challenges for governance, maintenance, maintainer burnout, funding, marketing, and more. Are you concerned about these things for your open source software too? Well, in the Sustain community, we discuss these challenges and share solutions for how to sustain open source in the long haul. We meet once per year in person, and the rest of the time we keep the fire burning in our discourse forum. Join our conversations at sustainoss.org and sustain OSS on Twitter. We know that it's dominant in, in many of the other sectors. We know that it's dominant in supercomputing, you know, of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Oh, it turns out 100%, 500 of them are Linux computers. Mobile phones, well, if we count Android as Linux, which we sh probably should, well, that's 78% of the market share embedded. So you're not going to put anything but Linux in that. A computers on Mars, you're not going to put anything else except for Linux on that. But the desktop, we have no idea. We have no idea whatsoever. This is really interesting because both the great popes of Linux and free software, both Linus Torvalds and, and Richard Stammen, both said that they were very interested in getting it to end users. They were not so interested in servers and stuff like that, but they have both in their beginnings explicitly said that getting it onto desktops to end users, to regular people, was what this was all about. And we don't know how many people are actually using it. We have no idea if that has been successful or not. So one of the hard parts of collecting those metrics is the fact that is how do users get their software? You know, we have Five Hub today, but most people still get their applications from their distribution, which collects nothing. How, what is the installed user base of an application? We don't know because they bypass the developer. So even the developer doesn't know what their user space is. So how does that work? Even today, like Zoom, for instance, something large news, Zoom probably doesn't know how people are using Linux. Well, they might because they have access from the server, but the distribution of the software is done through the distro. Things like that are, are challenges for collecting metrics. And in, from there, you know, showing the importance, uh, at least from app ecosystem measurement, what is the install base? Classically, what we have, you know, and this is where we get sort of like the, the number that says it's between two and 6%. I think it's more realistic to say that it's more closer to 2% than 6%, but whatever. Classically, we have relied on things like these internet web things that some people have installed on their websites and tells, I, I can't remember the name, something, something like Alexa, or I can't remember, that tell them, what web browser you're using and what system you're using. But the web browser, 
I think these metrics are very unreliable. I have no evidence to affirm that they are very unreliable, but I think they're very unreliable because it's so easy that people use different identification stream when they visit a page and things like that. But I don't see that those online services that supposedly count, and also they have their counters on so few websites that you don't know if that is the trend or not. I would like to direct the next question at Christy and Caroline. One of the things in the Chaos Project that we always talk about is community health and metrics around community health. And so I'm curious from a marketing communication perspective, do you communicate how well your community is doing in terms of community health? And what kinds of metrics do you look for when you communicate that? Or what metrics do you use in that communication? We maybe try to do that in some ways, but I don't know that we are very successful in capturing metrics for that or exactly know how to accomplish that. So when we're looking at community health, you know, we might be looking at comments on things. So how people are interacting with us on social media or in other mediums and also blogs, how our contributors are working on things and their experiences. But as far as I know, we don't have a great way of tracking exactly the overall health of the community. I agree with Caroline. Usually in GNOME, we have monthly meetings or weekly meetings for different teams, such as engagement team or social media or fundraising team. And one way that I personally use, let's say, to see how well the community is engaging is by looking on how many people join us during those meetings, if it's a crowd place, if not. Also, when we post, for example, different blog posts or different announcements in discourse or in our different chat platforms, we see how many responses we receive and we see how many shares we get for a specific topic or a specific announcement. So it's not that we have like a super sophisticated instrument to track what is the level of engagement, but we try to use this kind of ways to basically see if contributors are you know, willing to join us or how many contributors we have around. Recently, we have been trying to get, for example, people helping us organizing Guadec and also join us in different teams. And we usually coordinate with Caroline because she helps us she does a great job with the Twitter and our social media teams. And we see there how many people likes our posts or how many people actually joins our invitations when we send out the chat link. Somehow, this is the way that we use to see if we are getting new people or if those that are still in our community are willing to help us and join us. Okay, that's really cool. So you're looking at people and contributions and trying to see are there people actually engaging and contributing and using that as a way to look at community health and communicating that. So we're coming to the end of our time here. If we could just do one round, if there was one metric that you would like to see, would that metric be? And then the second question is, for people who would like to follow your work and connect with you, maybe online, where are you? So let's do one round with what metric would you like to see and where can people connect with you? I'll go in alphabetical order, Anika. I think not only for domestic users, of course, we know the professional users, but one metric which I would personally like to see would be for domestic users, if we could measure that. And I am available on metrics as an Ika Coker and on Telegram as well, and on social forums as an Ika Coker on Twitter. Thank you, Anika. Caroline. Yeah, I hate to be redundant, but users would be a great metric to know. And everything else kind of stems from that. So it's really like if we could get one metric, it would be users. And I, I'm on Telegram, I'm on Instance of Rocket Chat. I Sometimes use Twitter, mostly for the GNOME channel, but you can reach me there too if you really want to. Thank you, Caroline. Chrissy? Besides the users, which would be super cool, I would, I'm really so curious to see how many people in free software world contribute technically and non-technically. 
and you can reach me out at kprogri at gnome.org or you can write me on Telegram or in Twitter as well. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. Paul. I would like to know, for example, the level of deployment of Linux-based desktop users in official institutions. We get often news from such such an area has deployed Linux at schools or in this ministry or to all the, the police stations in France, etc. But we don't know. It is very dispersed and it is hard to get an idea of how many machines we're talking about, how many people access those machines, etc. And where can people find you and follow you online, Paul? Obviously, the KD community channels, and I also have a, a blog where I know that at least once I talked about metrics, and it's called quickfix.es, so it's quick fixes. Fantastic. So... We always like to round off our podcast with a round of value adds or picks where we talk about something that has brought value or joy or meaning to our life. And I'll kick us off and then we just go in whatever order people like to share something. Mine this week is marzipan. Marzipan is a something that I know from Germany and I don't really find it in the United States. It's something to eat sweet. And so I, I recently started making it myself. And the recipe is I take two cups of finely ground almond flour, two teaspoons of vanilla extract, and I put that in a food blender and start pouring honey in until I get the right consistency. And it is my favorite sweet dessert or just snack. So just discovering that recipe brings a lot of joy into my life. And I'm going to say my two velociraptors, my two black cats, they amuse me on a daily basis. So every day is a is sort of a different story with what those two will do. So if it's not Tom and Jerry chases running around the place, it'll be me trolling them with cat and animal videos, which gets them all kinds of <laughs> confused. <laughs> That's me. Sorry, stole my answer a little bit. I was going to say my dog, who you can see in the back corner there, but I'll switch it to a tool that we've been using for events. I contributed with GNOME before being hired for about two years, mostly with Guadic, our largest conference. And in the past, I think two Maybe we started right when I started contributing, we switched over to a new events platform and it's called Indico. And, you know, it's got some downsides in that we can't tweak it as much as we want to, but it has been so helpful in putting all of our pieces for the event together in one spot. We can have call for papers, we can have registration, we can have people like pay for registration if we need to, and we have links to sites and information. So being able to get that tool to work for us and put it all together has been super helpful in streamlining our stream, lining our event planning and organization. And for me, one of my friends suggested me a super cool book called Awareness by Anthony DeMello. I highly recommend that book. It's a lot on the self-improvement, let's say. It's, it's in, it includes some ways on how to destroy the negative feelings and how to work with confidence. So it's a very nice book. And I have done this, like I've put a metrics for me, for myself to read like at least 20 pages per day. And I think that I'm going well so far. So yeah, that's a good step for me. <laughs> I think so, for me, inspired by Siri, my, I'm away from my home. So my ne four year old nephew, he actually calls me and tells me everything what is happening at home. So that's a value had for me. So from my end, I also have a dog, so a shout out to that. But I'll give a shout out to the Cows Diversity and Inclusion Event Patching Program, actually, which I'm very happy to be a reviewer for. The program aims at encouraging events to obtain patches for reasons of self-improvement, self-awareness, and reflection on the topic of diversity and inclusion. And we touch upon these topics at the beginning of our discussion and Obviously, we all understand their importance for building healthy and open source communities. So if you are looking at organizing an, an event related to open source, 
to make sure to apply for a badge. Uh, and we'll put links to everything that has been mentioned in the show notes. So, Paul, do you want to round us off? Like you, I, I like cooking and I'm getting into Asian cooking because my son came back from London from uni and he said my Asian cooking was rubbish because I just, you know, got stuff out of a tin and used that and then made rice. And that was basically it. But so he said, no, you have to use fresh ingredients, which are not easy to obtain here in the south of Spain, Asian fresh ingredients, but, you know, you substitute it. But really what I am very interested in at the moment is I have a, a complex that I am a very clumsy, physically clumsy person. So doing stuff with my hands was never a big thing for me. But I have discovered that I am, not that I'm any good at this, but I've discovered something I can do that it doesn't necessarily destroy anything valuable, which is doing stuff with these electronic things and soldering them and stuff like that. Most of the times when I buy one of these chips, I have to buy three or four because I will destroy three or four in the process of actually soldering them. But they're cheap. So I, I do that. And, and then I connect stuff to them. And it never turns out into anything really before. But it's fun and it's entertaining and sometimes I can write an article about it and it will get published and people will read it and think that I'm good at something like this. Maybe we can put a link to your favorite board where you can put the electronics in the show notes. So it is time to say thank you. Thank you to all of you for coming on to the podcast today. Thank you, dear listener, for joining us today. To stay up to date on future episodes, subscribe for free to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. If you have ideas for future episode topics or would even like to come on as a guest, please email us, podcast at chaos community. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time, your chaos community.